All right. Thank you very much, Ashley. Appreciate your uh, introductions again. So this is the third IJSPT Journal Club. Uh, we have two great articles tonight. Uh, we have both of the authors that are here. Uh, as always, I have my uh, favorite co-host, Dr. Phil Page with us. Phil's waving. And we have our special uh, guest co-host tonight, the GOAT. Todd, you know, what a, you know what a GOAT is, don't you? Marina Williams or Roger Federer. Yeah, see, he knows Phil. He does <laughs> know. He does know, Rob. He does we know. were emailing earlier, Phil and I, and I said something about Ellen Becker being the GOAT. And uh, uh, Phil said, I bet he doesn't even know what that means. You got to ask him <laughs> if he knows what that means. I said, no, he'll know what the GOAT is. That's Mike Voigt. He's the GOAT. There's, <laughs> Boy, there's, there's the GOAT right there. Yeah, there He's he just is. listening. Yeah. Stud picture too. There you go. Oh, it's Ashley. Oh, it's oh, Ashley. It's Ashley. oh. masquerading is like yeah, yeah. Oh. No, she's still a goat, goat to me. She's yeah. still she's a, a goat. She's yeah. a mountain goat. Yep, that's right. <laughs> there you go. All right. So those are our uh, that's our co-host and um, our two uh, speakers tonight with us uh, that have uh, supplied us with these fantastic articles. Articles we're going to talk about. Um, First is Stephen Thomas. I'll let him tell you about himself in just a moment. And the second article is uh, Ryan Monty. Monty, is, is that, that's how you say your last name, isn't it, Ryan? Yeah, Monty. Okay. So the first article we're going to discuss uh, is the, the one by uh, Stephen Thomas. It's Jack Trainer, Matthew Pascarella, and Ryan Paul. I believe I met, I met Ryan when I was uh, at your place, didn't I, Steve? He was like a graduate student, I think, or finishing up. I think he was an undergrad then, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. He just started so, uh, school. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So the article that we're going to talk about first is the acute effects of percussive therapy on posterior shoulder muscles differ based on the athlete's soreness response. And uh, Steve is going to talk to us about it. So just quickly, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and then just briefly tell us uh, about your study and then uh, we'll have some questions and we'll just kind of pass it around to everybody and uh, find out questions and discuss your your article and then we'll go about uh, probably 20 25 minutes and then we'll um, move to Ryan's uh, paper. Sounds great. Uh, thanks Rob. Yeah, and thanks for for having me here. This is great. Uh, but I'm Steve Thomas. I'm a, a department chair and associate professor at Thomas Jefferson University in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I have a, you know, my clinical background is as an athletic trainer. Uh, but my PhD is in biomechanics and movement science. So can you tell us, just tell us, uh, give us a, a short, just kind of review of your study, Steve. I mean, the, the key key uh, findings of it, you know, wh what you were looking at, kind of why you're looking at, just give us, you know, a couple minute version of a uh, review of your study. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, we, uh, Jack uh, Trainer was the one that really wanted, you know, had some interest in this. He's, he used, the, the Theragun kind of tempt hand before uh, and he wanted to kind of investigate it. So, and I got to give them the credit, Jack, Matt, and and, and Ryan really did the, the majority of the work on this project and they, it came out really well. Um, so, you know, the idea was that, you know, when we kind of did this treatment, this intervention to the posterior shoulder specifically, you know, we saw this kind of variable response. Uh, some people described, you know, some soreness after, and then others said they felt, you know, a lot more loose and, and a lot of their soreness that they may have had, maybe from just, you know, working out and things like that kind of went away. So that was kind of intriguing and interesting to us. So we wanted to try to study it. So, um, you know, we, we designed the study to essentially look at, you know, some of these key features that we felt like that, you know, the, the device would really target. So increasing range of motion, um, you know, and we, we started in other studies looking at some of these muscle architecture features. Um, for us, they're kind of a, a metric for how, uh, how much tension is kind of going on in the muscle. So, you know, we thought it was, it would be a more direct me measure to kind of get at the specific infraspin infraspinatus anteriors minor, the specific external rotators that we were trying to target. Um, and we've kind of shown that in some baseball related work uh, that was recently published in American Journal of Sports Medicine. So, you know, we've, we wanted to include that methodology as, as well to, if we did see changes, to see what was the mechanism at play. Um, and then, we, of course, we want to look at strength because, you know, a lot of these kind of warm-up devices or, or uh, therapies, we don't want them to use them before a game, but then be at a detrimental strength loss, just like 
kind of just passive stretching and things like that. So that was kind of the intent on the methodology that we took. Um, and, you know, we measured that before we did the intervention for uh, five minutes and then we gave a 20 minute rest. So we also didn't want to do it and measure immediately because we know we're going to have kind of a peak effect. And then, you know, but athletes are going to take a period of time before they get out on the field before they use it. So we didn't want to just measure them immediately. We want to see what the true effects are kind of when they go in and participate athletically. So did that 20 minute wait and then um, and then just remeasure them, measure them again. Um, and, you know, after that intervention, they did that. Well, they did the soreness score before and after the intervention to describe, you know, how sore they were, if it got more sore, they actually improved in, in terms of their soreness. Yeah, I thought it was interesting uh, that you did the 20 minutes after, because most most studies, most of uh, the intervention studies you read, they do a, a stretching treatment, some kind of soft tissue, ASTEM or something like that. And then a lot of times it's just almost, I mean, it's immediately afterwards uh, that they remeasure. So it was, it was interesting. I, and that's another question I was going to ask you with, if we had time was what, what was the reason for the 20 minute delay? So I'm glad you answered that uh, already. So can you tell everybody, Steve, too, um, you and I talked about this before about the, uh, the first part of the paper really described a lot about DOMS um, and your subjects that you tested were just normal subjects that really didn't have DOMS. So what can you can you uh, describe, you know, why you included all of that and what the purpose of having the DOMS or how the DOMS relates to the percussive therapy? Yeah, yeah. So we want to include that kind of in, in the introduction just to give some background on, you know, some of the philosophy around these percussion devices to treat DOMS, right? So, you know, a big aspect of that is to kind of, you know, they describe softening the muscle, relaxing. Uh, diminishing tension within the muscle. So, you know, we, we kind of wanted in, to introduce that, that at least kind of, uh, you know, injury or pathology, even though we weren't necessarily looking at specific people with that. We did pick, you know, our subject pool were, we were looking for actively kind of rec recreational, active, um, you know, stu student body, you know, individuals, people in they were mainly in grad school um, that came in, but we did want to get people that were doing resistance training and working out. So we did kind of select them. And, but, you know, like we said, we didn't specifically uh, see if they had DOMS, but, you know, they were working out and they, you know, they had some kind of likely some muscular tension there that. Yeah. You, know, you didn't have them doing a DOMS pro you didn't have them doing like an eccentric protocol yeah. beforehand or anything. It was just in the, it was just in the literature. It was just in the introduction to relate it to people who typically use percussive therapy who may have DOMS. Exactly. Todd, Todd, I want to ask you a question about this uh, study because I didn't really realize that um, people like they, they saw a response where um, a certain portion of people really got sore after using the percussive therapy, but other people felt great after using the percussive therapy. Do you, have you seen that a lot when you use use the device? Like some people get way sore than other people and we're not really sure why. Um, actually, we haven't seen that as much, Rob, in the clinic and also on tour. Um, but I think some of it may be just the way the operator, you know, that we were actually using it. We do hear subjectively from patients sometimes that, oh, I, I had my wife or my husband do it and I, I seemed really sore after it. You just wondered, were they pushing too hard? Were they using, uh, you know, the, the tip that looks like a cone versus the one that looks like a muted ball or something like that? You know, just maybe they didn't have the correct pressure. And, and then, you know, that was one of the questions that, that, that I had for Dr. Thomas was, you know, how, how did you regulate the amount of pressure between individual? I mean, how, how did you come to the, the, the specifics of the technique, because obviously there's many ways to use these devices. And I think there's not a lot of guidance in the literature that I've seen. I don't know, Rob, if you've seen any, but no, as far as how hard you push, and I know you use a five minute duration with your, your treatment, which I think is very logistically practical. I think that's great. You do a study for 20 minutes, like who could do that for 20 minutes for crying out loud. So yeah, I think yeah. that the five minutes was really appropriate, but uh, no. So to answer your question, Rob, in a long winded way, which I'm known for is um, basically, uh, <laughs> 
uh, no, I haven't seen a lot with soreness. If somebody, if I use the device on somebody and they told me they had soreness, I would either not use it again, or in the clinical, I would use uh, uh, maybe a, a softer technique. Maybe I would even put a towel over the skin or something like that to, to basically decrease, particularly with older individuals, not necessarily athletes, but maybe an older person, as well as people like myself who are particularly muscular. Um, <laughs> you, know, you certainly can, uh, you can, you can push a lot harder than you can on somebody who's maybe after a shoulder replacement or something that's very frail and elderly and has very little muscle structure. So uh, a couple of things there to think about and maybe back to Dr. Thomas to comment yeah. on exactly how hard he pushed and how you standardize that as well amongst uh, you know, the treatment, the, the, the research. Yeah, so the, you know, I believe Jack was the one administering the treatment and you know, he used a kind of a moderate pressure you know, um, and just kind of kept that consistent and, and moved, you know, medial and lateral across the infraspinatus and then down over the teres minor and kind of just kept, you know, working in that kind of pattern as, as he went. Um, but, you know, I think there, we did look at, you know, because I was concerned about body mass, if, if individuals with a smaller body mass, maybe were the ones getting sore, that didn't really kind of pan out. Um, but I am wondering if maybe, you know, professional athletes, higher level athletes have a different sensitivity to this, right? Than just recreational athletes, maybe because they've never experienced anything like this, they, you know, their initial response to it was kind of getting sore where an athlete is very, you know, they, they undergo many different treatments and maybe they don't have that sensitivity. Yeah. Hey, Phil, I've got a question for you. Um, they used in this study, Stephen and the group used the soreness scale. Uh, which they adapted from a soreness scale from walking. Um, what it, what what's your take on that? Is that is is it okay to translate an upper extreme uh, lower extremity walking soreness scale to upper extremity and using the posterior shoulder uh, from a from a you know design and I guess stats. Yeah, it's, perspective. It's, it's a validation question, obviously. <laughs> Steven, I was going to ask you, in the paper, it actually still has the walking uh, in the table. Did you actually change that, the question three and four, to be more relevant to the shoulder mobility, like you said, in, in the paper? We just kept the same scale, and we told them to basically translate it to the their posterior shoulder. Um, so, you know, within those questions of, you know, is there light pain with... Uh, after I'm trying to think back, light pain with up and down stairs. We yeah. said, is there light pain with, you know, doing resistive exercise? Is there light pain with gentle walking? Is there light pain with moving? You know, so we kind of just verbally described what that, you know, translation to the push posterior shoulder was. We didn't write it out or change it because we want to use that validated measurement and not have to go through a revalidation process with the shoulder. So we, we basically just ask them to, you know, apply this soreness, if you know, scale to their posterior shoulder. I think, I mean, with all due respect, I think it would have been better to change it and just use it as a, as a limitation rather than leave it up to interpretation of the researcher and the subject um, to actually use this. Um, it does need to be validated, I think, Rob, to your question. Um, about the shoulder, I think it has great possibility. Um, that being said, I know that within research, it's tough to find these types of scales that are mm -hmm. specific to what you're looking for. And it would just, it would have just been better to kind of be more specific. Like you were saying, Stephen, if I wanted to repeat this study, I'd love to have that exact terminology that you said, you know, for my subjects. Yeah, um, yeah I 100% agree. That I was wanted, definitely a limitation. <laughs> I, I did want to, uh, so I'll take the floor real quick, Rob. Sure, sure, yeah. You know, this reminds me, and Todd Ellenbecker will remember, uh, great studies by Dave Baim up in uh, uh, Canada that were the first to look at roller massage. Um, and this, this reminded me of those studies because they found the same things you did, Stephen, that there was an in immediate increase in flexible range of motion or muscle length without a decrease in strength. And what they actually did with the, with the roller massage, they use those stick rollers. They uh, um, Dwayne Button and that that crew actually created a device that put a standardized weight on each side and actually pushed it down onto the muscle. And so I know that's not as practical with this situation as Todd was asking with the pressure, but that is something that I did also ask. But to your point, Stephen, 
I did like the question of body comp um, because I think that someone who's as muscular as Todd will not respond as much as skinny Phil Page over here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so look at that guy's like, arms. Oh my God. I know, right? Hey. Don't, right. Break, don't break the shirt while we're watching, I, Todd. Come on, you I, have to I change your shirt after you Steven, um, I did question. I did ha have a question about the penation angle. I love. I'm. I'm loving ultrasound and loving how we're learning more about it and using. I know uh, Rob is using it in his school as I am as well. And evaluating the penation angle was really interesting. And I know you referenced a study that you had done that you published in AJSM. I didn't get a chance to look at it. But can you tell me a little bit more? You made a comment that penation was related to tension. And I can see how that works. Obviously, a, a more uh, tensioned muscle would have a more narrow penation. But has that actually been researched or studied in terms of validating that claim that penation is related to tension? So not directly related to tension. But um, if you look at, so if you look at the muscle under ultrasound, right? So if I passively stretch, and you watch it dynamically, you will see the penation angle will get smaller, right? So if the tension is coming from the tendon, it will pull, you know, and it's going to align in the direction of loading. But what you see if, if the muscle contracts, the penation angle gets bigger right. because the tension's in the sarcomere. So it's going to pull that central tendon in, right. you know, so that was, you know, essentially trying to determine if we saw an increase or a decrease in a way tells us where is the tension locate it, right? Is it an attendant tension or is it a sarcomere neuromuscular kind of tension potentially? So that's kind of, you know, in, in those previous studies, how we've determined it. It hasn't been validated because really there, you know, you would have to use an animal study or something uh, and, and really be able to passively measure how much tension is in that individual mm -hmm. muscle tenant unit. Um, and that just hasn't been done. Was that how you also mentioned involuntary, what'd you get, involuntary contraction was a term you used, involuntary activation. activation. I think is what it was, yeah. What did you mean by that? Uh, so, you know, what we found in a previous study that we looked at uh, the effects immediately after the acute effects after pitching, um, you know, we see this increase in penation angle, and it seems to be this kind of involuntary contraction that's occurring. Hmm. So, you know, we think it may be related to the release of calcium during eccentric contractions and, and making actin and myosin essentially bind almost like a rigor mortis effect mm -hmm. until mitochondria become functional again and ATP could come in and release that myosin head. So we kind of think that's, you know, possibly what's going on. Again, it's just a theory. We, we can't, you know, really test that specifically, but, um, you know, that's at least our hypothesis of what's Love the mechanism. It. Love it. Love to test it. All right, Rob, I'll shut so up. Todd, okay, no, no worries, no worries, Phil. Anytime, <laughs> feel free to ask anything you want. That's why you're here. The um, Todd, how are you? How, so how how are you using um, percussion either in the clinic or with the uh, at the USTA level with the athletes? How are you using it different on the shoulder than say Stephen did in this study? Almost exactly the way um, you know we target the posterior shoulder, maybe a little bit more on the scapular area because we do see a lot of because from compensatory muscle function and whatnot with upper extremity repetitive activation, uh, you know we go after the scapular muscles, you know beyond just the infraspinatus. But uh, we uh, we actually have the athletes. One of the, one of the other selling features for those of us that work in sports <coughs> system um, is that the athlete can do a lot of their areas of their body themselves. You know for the IT band, the quadriceps, hamstrings, you know those types of things. So we do many different areas. Clinically, uh, as I see primarily shoulders in the clinic, um, I use it for a lot of uh, upper trapezius overuse, uh, some of that kind of thing, both as a time saver, just because of a, a busy clinical environment. I find that a couple minutes with a Theragun is certainly uh, better suited than my hands for um, you know, 15 minutes or something, which I don't typically have for soft tissue work. And so those would be some of the applications that I'd use it for. And not that it's necessarily better, but that it is a good alternative and it seems to be working uh, reasonably well, so. How often would you say you use you use the, the, the percussion devices versus actually using your hands? I mean, are you doing 90% percussion device now uh, and 10% hands-on or 50-50? What, what, um, or can you even break it down? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm not a big soft tissue guy. So, um, you know, I think, um, 
I think Reagan might have been president the last time I did an extensive <laughs> soft tissue work on a patient in the clinic. But uh, no, I'm just kidding, of course. But uh, but yeah, so you know, we obviously use a lot more mobilization and uh, passive stretching and things of that nature. However, um, I'd say you know maybe 20% percussion and uh, you know other techniques 80% of the time. I do use dry needling uh, fairly regularly for the upper trapezius and some of the periscapular musculature. But again, not because the percussion instrument isn't isn't uh, effective or my hands aren't effective. But just you know, different different techniques that I've had success with. Uh, what about you, Rob? Uh, tell me a little bit about how you use the percussion but device. I, I I'm not using it yet in the clinic. I'm not using okay. it yet. We don't have one in the clinic. I have the one that we have for our research study, and I haven't okay. taken it to the clinic yet. Uh, so I haven't used it. I've used it on myself some, um, and it it feels nice. I I'm, I think I'm a positive responder because I, I like the way it feels on my posterior shoulder. Yeah. Um, I don't, uh, what I do not like is uh, like if someone's doing it and they happen to hit like your uh, scapular spine, uh, you know, where you hit the bone, that's a little, it's a little jarring and a little uncomfortable when it hits the bone, but um, I think it feels great. And um, again, I'm, I'm, I think I would be a positive responder, not necessarily a negative uh, yeah, responder. That, that's one thing I did like, Stephen, about your design was having responders and non-responders and, and how you quantified that. Because I thought if you if you try, and this is a common thing we see as a, a kind of a limitation of some studies, is you you bundle all these people together, and you talked about how people just respond to everything, like from gate control theories and all that. When you bundle that together, you know you're you're diluting the effect of those who may be a benefit versus those who have just a different response system. So I did like the way that you were able to. Just take someone that didn't have any problem with DOMS and you just said, how does this feel? Because I do think, to Rob's point, some people just don't like this stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, some people don't like massage and things right. like that. I mean, there's right. certain people don't like mm -hmm. things touching them. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a good point, Rob. Someone uh, on the uh, chat, um, uh, where is it at here? Oh, it's Jonathan. Jonathan's son. Jonathan's on. Thanks, Jonathan, for joining uh, Jonathan said, great question. The Theragun brand percussion device has a pressure sensor that Bluetooths to your phone that allows you to gauge the amount of pressure. I didn't know it. I didn't know it had that. So Todd, it's got the, uh, the Theragun actually has a device that'll, that'll show you the pressure. And then we have a, uh, we have a question here too from uh, Richard, looks like Tillotson. How do you feel about percussion devices and joint replacement? So people have had joint replacements and using percussion devices on them. Do you, do you use that on those folks, Todd? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that is a population that we do use it. And uh, again, I, you know, we use the example of, uh, you know, if, if you think of a joint replace, you know, a, a possible joint replacement in an 85 year old uh, woman who's very frail and, and has very little muscular development, you have to be extremely careful to stay off the bony prominences around the shoulder. Obviously, you wouldn't uh, use the percussion device near the implant. But um, where I use it, uh, this would be an example where we do use it. There's a great deal of compensatory function with both reverse TSA and TSAs uh, in the acute phase and some of the intermediate phase postoperatively where people essentially, as we all know, use their upper trapezius as a major uh, compensatory structure. And so in those people, they come in and they're, they're fired up as all heck in their upper trap. You see Ashley right now, uh, you know, touching her upper trap. She's probably She's tired shrugging, yeah. as well. She's struggling. Trigger and points, yeah. But, uh, but uh, for sure, the shoulder patients, uh, you know, that's one where we would use it. And I'd have no, no hesitancy as far as uh, using it in a safe manner and have used it in many total joint replacements, mainly shoulder. I don't really see some of the lower body uh, joint replacements, although I will say in our clinic, uh, Tad Pachinski and some of our other clinicians who see mainly lower body joint replacements, they use it pretty extensively for the IT band, the gluteals, some of the other muscles, uh, you know, around the hip complex and whatnot, and, and have had good success with it. Phil enjoys it on his gluteals. So, so I've heard. Only when, when you I, do it, Rob. Only <laughs> when I do it. Yeah, I do. I do have to give props out to Ashley because she did a wonderful webinar on percussion. Um, I think with hyper hyper ice. Um, and well, we need to was, put that. We need to put that up on the uh, website so we can all yeah, see it. I, I guess. And I'm not. I'm not doing it shameless. I mean, I really. It, she opened my eyes to a lot. A lot different way of thinking about how you could actually integrate this in the clinic. So I do recommend from a very practical standpoint that people check that out. I really did like what you did, Ashley. Thank you. I, I cool. do use this stuff a ton. So I agree with kind of everything you guys are saying. I'm mostly all lower body too, so. Yeah, yeah. 
All right. Well, if anyone doesn't, if does anyone else have any uh, quick questions for uh, Stevens, uh, so we can move on? We're about halfway uh, through already. This goes so quick, doesn't it? I mean, it yeah, seems like totally we just start and it's already like but, uh, halfway over. I had um, the. So I think you hit pretty much my questions. And one thing, Steve, I did want to mention was you that that's interesting is you have, and you you talked about the very small changes in range of motion, like one degree, two degrees, and we know that that's with, probably within the standard error of the measurement. Um, and yet you found significant difference between them. And I've been finding um, that these small differences, for whatever reason, still continue to be statistically significant. It drives me nuts that the question becomes that people read this and they go, oh, there's this great st statistically significant difference. But in reality, and you, you pointed out that it's a four degree difference between the positives and the negatives. How do you how do you what, what do you say about things like that when you have this great statistical difference but really is it clinically relevant right and that yeah that's a good question right is if is that range of motion that you gain gonna benefit that athlete right or that you know that patient that you have in front of you and you know in this case obviously they weren't patients they didn't have an injury they didn't you know so we don't know you know but you know, we do know that it created a certain response, right? And, you know, it was measurable. We, we were able to identify and it, and it did come up statistically significant. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's more about, you know, the kind of take home message of all this is, is really, you know, make sure you're identifying if your patient has a positive or negative response, especially if you're going to use this, you know, pre-activity, pre-competition um, because if, you know, if you don't kind of consider that, I think you could have negative effects from an athletic performance standpoint. Great. I was, was going to ask Rob one quick question. Uh, have you tried this out to tenderize your steak yet? No, I haven't, <laughs> not, but I need to get, I need to bring my nimble don't, back. Don't invite Todd for dinner. He's then. on my uh, pork butt or uh, maybe some <laughs> just, ribs. Just maybe I can sure. break down some collagen in the ribs. Good thinking, just Steve. Make, make sure you clean it before you test it out. <laughs> Take it back. That's right. Todd's mouth is watering over there with all that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. All right. Uh, I just wanted to tell Steve, Stephen, there's, um, if you can look, see on the chat, uh, there's some people that are asking, I think, some great questions that we won't have time to get to. If you want, you, you don't have to, but if you want, you can um, try to answer some of those on the uh, chat while we move on to uh, Ryan. If you don't want to, you can hang out with I us still. I'll and... pop on and answer a couple of them. So. Okay. Oh, you're answering? Okay, you're answering some of them. Good. Here. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ash. All right, so next we're going to move to Ryan uh, Monty. And Ryan's study uh, is the Curlin Job Orthopedic Clinic Shoulder and Elbow Score used as a patient-reported outcome measure for the youth and high school aged baseball athlete. And uh, I just want to start off also saying that I think this is a great study. Um, Todd uh, was talking earlier about how we can't really use a lot of the outcome tools that we use. You can't use with really athletic uh, people because they, they score like perfect on them. So even, even though we're seeing them in the clinic for problems, they have a perfect score and, and insurances and um, Others then say, you know, what are you doing seeing this patient when they, they, they don't even appear to have any problem when they do have significant uh, issues? So, Ryan, just tell us a, a little bit about yourself really quickly. And then can you tell us, just give us uh, the summary of uh, your study and then we'll we'll uh, kind of get into it with you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Um, so first off, um, my background is I'm a board certified clinical specialist in sports PT, uh, completed, previously completed a clinical fellowship in the upper extremity athlete. So I've worked in pediatric sports originally and professional sports, um, overhead athletics being uh, being kind of a mainstay for me. Um, currently, uh, I'm a full-time professor at Walsh University in North Canton, Ohio, and completing my currently in the process of completing my PhD through Nova Southeastern University. Um, so to give you a little bit of background about the study, uh, we we examined the KJOC, and I'll just call it the KJOC, so I don't have to say the whole name. <laughs> So the KJOC and its application to the youth and high school baseball athlete. This is a, it's a patient reported outcome measure that contains um, 10 questions and each question is rated on a visual analog scale. Originally it was validated for the adult baseball athlete. So our purpose was to look at the younger demographic and to see if, uh, if two groups could be separated, which was those throwing with pain versus those throwing without pain. And if we could find a prediction threshold score that could de delineate that. Um, what we found was that there was a cut score of 68.6 out of 100, and these two groups were statistically significant. 
Fantastic. Thank you for the summary. So um, I guess I'll start with um, a couple of questions. So one of the first um, I have is um, the, the uh, KJOC, I th one, one of the things about the KJOC is, and you mentioned this just briefly, Ryan, in, uh, I think it was in your discussion, the, the KJOC also asks about the effect of symptoms on like uh, the athlete's sports relationship um, with others or with the team or something like that, which I don't think a lot of, a, a lot of the, um, a lot of the patient reported outcomes that we have don't even touch base on that at all. So to me, that seems important. What, what do you think? And I guess Phil, Todd, and uh, maybe Stephen, what how, do you think that's important that there's a uh, question that relates to that? Uh, I mean, kind of like their, their emotional state about it or how they feel, you know, um, uh, about relationships and things like that. Yeah. If, um, if I could, if I could go first, um, with the, with the I, I relate things back to the ICF model and how things influence activity. And if there are some other contextual factors like environment or personal things that could influence activity, such as a coach continually telling somebody to throw through pain, that could be a factor that's into that scale. So um, I do think those factors need to be considered versus just asking, hey, does this person have pain? Because there may be some other things that contribute to that. Yeah. What do you what do the rest of you think? I, th I think in physical therapy as a whole, we're we're certainly much more more focused on the musculoskeletal aspects and not the uh, psychological aspects of some of these other things that are more difficult to measure. But in sports medicine, we see firsthand the the stressors on the athlete and how it affects their whole body, their performance, and everything else. And so I think it's a um, you know while it's only a ten question um, instrument to actually dedicate one of the questions to that shows some insightfulness by the uh, developers to say that there are other things other than the typical, you know, my arm feels dead or I feel weak or I can't throw as fast or whatever it can be. Those are the obvious things. So I thought it's a very intriguing uh, question and certainly one that deserves more study. Yeah, I really, I, I mean, I like that question, but I like a lot of the questions because it really gets to this is long standing issues, right? When you look at all these questions, it's not, you know, did you just acutely experience pain or any issues with your shoulder or elbow? Really, it's, you know, this is longstanding. If it's affecting your emotional state with your coaches and things like that, this or has been going players, on. Other right. players or this family going, or anything. Yeah. Yeah, this has been going on for a long time. And you know, it's a lot more serious than just some, you know, kind of acute experience of pain or fatigue or something like that. It, Ryan, from, from what I did, and, and I'm going to play dumb person here. When I first read this, I'm like, why do I have to have a tool that tells me if someone has pain? The way that this read was it was able to tell me if a kid had pain or not. And as I read and I got to the end of your paper and you start talking about ICF and I'm like, oh, now I kind of get it. It's kind of like it's the impact of the pain on things rather than does the kid have pain or not? And that's where I was getting lost with this dichotomous outcome of, yeah, I know the kid has pain, but to what level, you know, if you have one to, how much does it hurt? One to 10. Well, how much does it hurt when I do these 10 things? Now I have a number. And so I just kind of want to make that comment as looking at this from someone I've never used this score. I felt like, I guess, defining it a little bit earlier would have been helpful for me until I got to the end to figure out the value of your tool. What other uh, the, the, uh, this is I'm just asking the panel again now. What other um, what other patient reported outcomes do you guys use in athletes? Do you use some like because sometimes we we use, the one we use a lot of times is a quick dash and it's no it's no good for athletes because they're mm. like I said I mean they all score eleven I mean they can they can touch their back they can uh, cut a piece of meat with their knife uh, and they can carry a grocery bag so I mean they score an eleven they're perfect. Um, do you guys use others? Um, there really aren't any other than the KJOC, is there? I mean, that's really the only yeah, one the, for really sport. Uh, the, the FAST is uh, throwing specific uh, questionnaire developed by Eric fast. Sowers. Yeah, at AT Stills, Eric Sowers and, and Kelly Blevin and, and that group have developed the FAST and validated it. So that is another okay. measure. Um, I think it's a little more extensive than, than just the yeah. KJOC. Yeah, the, the FAST is the functional arm scale for throwers, and I believe there's 22 items on it. So like you said, and then there's also, I mentioned 
Also, there's the youth throwing score that's come out too. So um, those are two of the latest ones that are out there. Is it youth, score, youth throwing score? Is that like a, a brand new one? It is a brand new one. Um, instead okay. of visual analog scale, it's more of a Likert. So there's seven questions on a Likert scale. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, this My question related to this is for Phil. Phil, because you have like, you know, just a certain number of a scale of a score that you can reach on this, does, does something like this have a, and can you describe, I guess, does it have a floor? Will this, will this, a, will a scale like this have a floor and a ceiling effect? Um, and can you explain what that is to uh, everybody in case they're not sure? I mean, the, the, those mean that, you know, the people that are near the top or near the bottom ceiling or floor, the small changes within those groups are hard to detect. And I think you kind of hit on it with, uh, the tool that you said, the dash, was it was the dash, whatever dash, one, yeah. that when you get to the top, you've got these athletes that just can't get any higher than that. That's that ceiling effect. And and so I'm not, again, sure about the, the floor and ceiling with this. I would assume that it did, that you'd have these kids, because it's saying you, you probably had some kids that were over at 100 or whatever, 10 out of 10, because they were reporting, oh, I'm fine, no problem. Um, and then, and that brings me to a real quick question or point I wanted to make Ryan too, was, do you think this would have had a different response rate of the kids that were going to the clinic with pain versus if you went to the ballpark and asked them if they had pain? Because the kids on the, on the field are not going to say, oh yeah, my arm's hurting. But once they're in that clinic, they're going to go, oh yeah, I'm hurting. Yeah, I'm sure that, no, Phil, that's a great point. So when somebody uh, obviously wants to continue to play, that'll continue to bias uh, what they're going to report. So yeah, if I was at, if I was at physically at the ball field, I'm sure they would. Hey, is my coach listening? Am I supposed to say that? <laughs> so, no, that, that's a great point. I mean, I did like how you you said in the study that you you made sure that the parents didn't have influence or weren't involved in the scoring process. That it really left the kids to decide what their score was. <laughs> That was really good to do that, you know. Thank the you. Parents always get in the way, don't they? Of, a, of a, like our work. I mean, they just yeah. seem to be like the parents are the worst. Poor I, kids. I've heard, I've heard many things, right? You don't need a uh, a surgery. You need new parents, right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I see that. I hear that. Or I see it all, all the time. Um, Ryan, can you tell me the? Um, as I looked at your study and looked at the findings, your painful group had both catchers and pitchers while the non-painful group didn't. Do um, you think that affected your scores that way? Uh, I think it would. I think that's a very valid question as well because the dynamics of every position are different. A catcher is going to throw as many throws as a pitcher is going to throw. Mm -hmm. And the daily exactly. grind is a little bit different too. I think um, also you have to consider for the young individual, when do they specialize in one position? Because the younger we get, they're going to be playing multiple positions in the field, which does that lead to overuse too? So they maybe not they may not specialize as a pitcher maybe till sixteen, say, um, when they get into the high school years. So I do think that do, there is probably some influence there, and probably we should maybe think about even looking at different subgroups as well for this questionnaire versus just ten through eighteen. Yeah, so I have to question Todd. You know, I look at this as baseball where does this fit in tennis is would this be beneficial for you guys you know in the tour or somebody that's just uh, playing tennis how would this help you guys I think it helps immeasurably we use it in tennis players we just tell them to substitute everywhere they see throwing to substitute it with serving and ground stroke um, but again it uh, I'll be honest when I read uh, Ryan's fine study uh, it immediately made me think why haven't we done this in tennis? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Way to go, Ryan. Uh, so, uh, but no, that's that's what's great. Uh, to be honest, that's a huge compliment to the researcher because when others read the study and they're motivated to replicate or do an offshoot of it, it just tells you what a great job uh, you know, that you did. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, Phil, you bring something up that's, that's really important. And an instrument like this should have descriptive data or normative data, whatever profile you'd like to use or nomenclature you'd like to use. But 
it's so great to know, you know, in this case, what somebody between 10 and 18 who hasn't had pain, what their score is versus somebody who does have pain. And you mentioned in your review of literature, the softball study and some of the other throwing studies, there's been a number of them by Olympus Fosti and some of the Curl and Joe people as well uh, that have looked at what that normal response is. Because one of the things we did look at is the modified ASCS, the modified row, and a couple of other scales in, in high level tennis players, junior tennis players. And we found that by, even though they were, they, were, they were at a tournament and they were completely healthy, there's no way they were they were uh, scoring the full amount, you know, the ceiling effect. There was no 100. They weren't they weren't actually doing 100 because even when they're not injured, there's still some latent soreness and fatigue and different things that go in. So I think we need to know that in virtually every uh, every subpopulation. And that's why each of these studies is important. Um, one thing I would just throw out for a quick second is that uh, in 2018, Masa Sariki from San Jose State University and I did a study where we looked at people with and without scapular dyskinesis before a season of collegiate baseball and after. And we found that those that did not with visually observed via video um, have scapular dyskinesis, those that did not have it actually had the identical uh, KJOC pre and post season. But the individuals who had scapular dyskinesis at the beginning of the season went through a season of collegiate baseball, went from 89 on a KJOC to 63. So that was one of the instruments. We looked at other factors as well, but the idea being that the KJOC was actually sensitive to a decrease or a decrement during the course of a collegiate baseball season, only in those individuals that had scapular dyskinesis. So we see another application of this device uh, if you're doing injury surveillance, which many of us do in sports medicine and, and, and when we're tasked to, to look after athletic teams or individuals, we actually can use this as a surveillance mechanism in addition to a point of use application. So I just so throw that out as a, a side there. 2018, we did that. Were you, were you, how, how often were you testing them with that, Todd? Just two times, once two at the times, beginning okay. of the season and then once at the very end. Okay, so you were, is, it, is there any value of, of doing it kind of serially, like middle of the season, see if, they, I, see if the score changes? To be honest, I, I think it would be. I mean, it'd be like a lot of different things. It's like looking at hydration. You know, if you look at measure somebody's hydration through the season or manual muscle testing, you look at the posterior cuff preseason, you look at it mid season or maybe every month or something. Yeah. And, you know, they're going along really well. And all of a sudden you see a drop yeah, see a blip, of you know, yeah. four or five Newton meters or something in strength. You go, whoa, you know, it's time to pull this guy out, have him put, put him on a program. So I think it could be something that'd be done at the same time. The beauty is too, it's 10 questions. It's very easy to do. Yeah, it's quick. Uh, yeah. It's not translated to other languages. And I don't know if, you, I, I assume everyone in Ryan, your study spoke English, but that's one thing we've looked at in tennis because we, we primarily, uh, English is not, it's the number one language, but not by a lot. Uh, we have a number of different languages that would be nice to use and it's not validated in other languages which at this moment is is a bit uh a bit of a disadvantage because people like to do it in their native language of course i think um i think it has for turkish but i could be wrong um i think there is a study specifically you know for that you, you're exactly right i i would say that uh, other than phil page i don't know anyone else who speaks turkish no, but no. uh but uh, so that application is less than in french or espanol of course so uh, and, but yeah that's good to know additionally um they also utilize the scale over the phone where each person rated on a scale of zero to a hundred, each score, each, each of the 10 questions and you divide the score by 10, and then you'd add up those 10 numbers to get your score out of a hundred. So they found that those greater than 13 or greater than 13 years of age, that there was reliability between both forms of testing paper and over the phone. Yeah, huh. Interesting. And right, I was going to ask a quick question. Do you, you know, that it's a pretty big age range that you looked at. Do you think, you know, their maturity level, you know, has anything to do with how they're answering these questions and what number they're picking? Yes, I do. Um, so previous literature shows that actually utilize a visual analog scale. There also has to be an IQ of at least 100 to answer a visual analog scale. So I do think interpretability of questions is also need, can vary between individual. Additionally, um, <clears throat> when we're looking at some of the some of the wording, it's also, there's words like instability and difficult that may be interpreted different across different individuals. The younger we get, we have a tendency to be, they have a tendency to be more dichotomous thinkers and picking the endpoints mm -hmm. more so. So I do think that maybe there's a large interquartile range, as you can see in, in my study, that maybe, you know, we should probably look at these groups a little bit more separately to kind of kind of avoid the crossover between those scores between the groups. So I think that could be studied a little bit more. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Brian, there was also a question um, from Jonathan saying, 
Chris recently published an AJSM study implicating showcase exposures and the relationship to UCL tears. Did you consider those plane and traveler showcases versus those who did not? Yeah, so we didn't uh, actually, uh, we didn't factor everything in regarding, you know, like how often they were playing and regarding that. So I think that could be another variable to definitely consider is, you know, are they playing in travel leagues, showcases? Are they throwing 12 months out of the year? Is there an overuse exposure rate? How many pitches they're throwing? Other things like that could probably be variables to kind of consider. Um, so I think that's definitely a valid point. I think that could be further researched as well. What uh, Ryan, I your your cutoff. Well, you you didn't do the cutoff, but the cutoff score for adults was eighty one. Mm -hmm. uh, your study showed for the adolescents sixty eight point six. What's the big? What's the such? Why is such a large difference between the two? Yeah, I think it goes back to what I had previously said about um, <clears throat> we had do have a large interquartile range between those that were throwing uh, with pain. There's a large range there, so I think. Um, I think overall having that large range as kind of having that large age range has kind of created kind of a difference maybe in that score. So I would kind of look at maybe like we talked about, is there levels of play like 10U, 11U, or is there high school differences between early high school and late high school? I think there would be some differences there um, that we could probably investigate a little bit further. Um, but yeah, that 81.3 versus 68.6. And I also think about interpretability, like we said, of each item too. It could yeah. probably be looked into. Good point. Good point. There's a, a question on the chat. Does it uh, from Spencer Noble? Does it take into consideration cultural background differences on the perception of pain and personal injury? Yeah. So this was a purposive sample, all in Northeast Ohio. So we there's maybe just um, with that regarding, it's not, it can't be um, we can't extrapolate it to every every population. So. With that said, I, I would like I would love to look at this from different cultural backgrounds because there is differences on what to push through for pain and how pain is perceived and stuff of that nature. And it would definitely change the rating of each question on each scale. So I do on, on each question rather. So I do think um I do think that's another valid point. But for our specific, because this was a purpose of sampling in one specific area, I think that becomes becomes a little bit of an issue to extrapolate it to other cultures as well. All right, I have some nerdy stats questions before we get to the real cool stuff at the end. So Ryan, I do have some stats questions and I'm wondering um, why you use the Man Whitney U test for a yeah. parametric outcome. Um, so our, um, our data, we were looking at previous literature, the data has been not uh, uh, non-normally distributed. So we were assuming that the assumption was not going to be met, which uh, when we went back and did, um, we looked at the normality, the, the assumption, it was it was a non-normal distribution. So using a man Whitney, you and non-parametric actually satisfied right. um, that assumption there. So I just wish you would have put that in the paper. Yeah. I figured that's what it was. It was not normally distributed. Yeah. Um, the other thing was looking at, and and I'm not you know, an expert on receiver operating uh, curves, but um, I do have a, a good understanding of them in the Uden statistic. Um, it really, and just for the, the viewers here real quick, the Uden statistic is really just that relationship between sensitivity and specificity, more specifically one minus specificity. It looks at the, you're looking for the cutoff as Rob was saying, is the cutoff number is that highest number uh, which is that difference between the false, the true positives and the false positives. And, you know, how accurate is my test? And one of the cool things about that uh, ROC, the receiver operating curve, is that it was actually developed after World War II um, by our American radar operators in Hawaii who were trying to decipher the noise to signal ratio for the Japanese airplanes coming in to see how accurate the radar was. And so that's how this kind of started. Um, and so I do wanna ask you, Ryan, about, um, you mentioned a logistic regression and I don't, I didn't, I'm not familiar with the, I don't think you need to do a logistic regression to get to an ROC, but and I didn't see how you did anything with the logistic regression here. Can you talk about what what you did with the logistic regression and what you found? Yeah, so, um. 
we graphically with an ROC, you can graphically represent a binary logistic regression that way. And we all we we also did some other stats just to confirm that the model had fit. Uh, and so that's where the kind of logistic regression is. Did, did the model fit with the prediction okay. we were assuming, which it did. Um, you ran the logistic regression and then tried to fit it with that yeah, yeah. with the ROC. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So can you um, just run an ROC without a logistic regression? You theoretically could, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. All right. Just want to confirm. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a stats nerd. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, no, because I got that question too from a from a colleague not so, not so long ago when this came out. So okay. Um, and it's it's a, I guess it's also a matter of what what to report too. Um, with the ROC, it kind of graphically shows that binary um, um, logistic. It just shows that binary relationship there of dichotomous variables. So in the result for for those in the audience, I mean, what did you have? A point eight. Um, what was that number you had? 0.891 area under the curve. Yeah. Um, and a one is perfect, like all true positives and no false negatives. And you got a 0.891, which is pretty darn good. Yeah. yeah. So we're 89% sure that we're fitting yeah. underneath that area underneath the curve. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Sorry, Rob. Sorry, everybody. No, no, no need to apologize, Philly. That's why you're here, buddy. Um, one more question from the, uh, see, this is David Massey on the chat. Do you think the KJOC could be used as an injury prevention tool to stop shoulder injuries before they happen or predict when an injury may occur if an athlete continues to push through the pain? Yeah, so from, <clears throat> from a screening tool, somebody was going to go before their season, <clears throat> let's say, and this could be utilized by coaches or part of your preseason screening, and you notice maybe somebody was reporting things on a little bit lower maybe that could maybe show up as a red light or a yellow light to kind of question things a little bit further on uh, exposure or stuff of that nature. I, I think this could be studied further to say, Hey, can this be used to say, Hey, there's, you know, is there something in the future that they're reporting that could, that could predict the outcome of pain in the future? I think that could be further researched, but um, I think this could be used. It's more for a screening tool. I also consider it, um, I consider when you're trying to have somebody, you know, initiate maybe a throwing program and uh, you want to say, hey, is it, you know, are they, do, how are they feeling with their throwing program? The communication maybe isn't the best with the younger individual. And these 10 questions may actually kind of bring up some other questions that may spark some interest too. So um, I kind of think of it in both ways to answer that question. Rob, can I hop in? Um, yeah, sure. At athletic training side of things. Yeah, I think this is a good way because athletic trainers are so busy, right? They have so much to do. They can't do these detailed assessments on everybody at preseason. So I think if you're getting your baseball team through, this is a good way to have everybody go through this, this questionnaire and identify the people that you need to do a more detailed assessment on. And now you kind of, you know, maximizes your effort. And, and I think you, have, you know, you could select out those people that, um, that, that more specific assessment and then intervention will, will have the most impact on. Sorry, muted. So, uh, Ryan, so I think Stephen maybe alluded, answered this, but do you, are there any other ways that you think, uh, like for, you know, like a take home message of how, how we can use your findings, um, you know, clinically or uh, in the training room? Any other thing, any other things you can add other than what Stephen just described? Yeah, I think um, if if like let's say you're in a in a physical therapy setting or athletic training room and you have somebody going through any type of physical activity and you want to just know their response to it or just how they're doing, I think this is something you could do that that day of. And in all honesty, I think this takes I, I put ten minutes. It probably takes probably around four and a half minutes, so probably less than that to fill it out. Um, so I think their exposure to physical activity and the response could be can be then um, objectified a little bit more to kind of figure out how they're actually feeling. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, I do like the, the, the part of this that I liked about this report was uh, I did, I did have that same question of, I, I felt like if we could be able to use this score to predict injury or performance, that would have been a lot better than telling me if the kid had pain. But what I was also looking for was the fact that, and in, in as you do an ROC, and not a lot of not not a lot of people understand how you use the ROC and that relationship between specificity and sensitivity to make a decision. 
because as we know, everything is not black or white. And so you have to balance that. How bad is it if I give you a false positive compared to a true positive? And that's where that balance comes in. That's what that cutoff score means is where are we at with uh, not just clinical decision-making, but the new thing, the thing that we need to do as therapists and trainers is shared decision-making. And you're going to go to that. How do you use the statistic to go to the patient and go, hey, this is what I see. This is what your test shows me. And you, we've got to balance this. And how can you help me make that right decision for you? And that's what I love about this type of study and this statistic is that it allows, if the clinician understands how to use it properly, you can actually have a more informed way of talking to your patient about the decisions you need to make for some type of intervention. Great, fantastic points, Phil, as always. Um, uh, we have like five minutes left. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions from yeah, there's one in the Q&A here um, said, uh, has there been research done on accuracy of outcome measures completed written versus verbal? The clinic I work in has been pushing for verbal secondary to feeling it is more accurate. I'm curious if this has been validated. Yeah, so um, I think we mentioned this a little bit ago, but the KJOC has been, has been uh, it can, uh, it's been um, statistically found to be reliable over the phone for those greater than 13 years of age. So and basically, you would just ask every question on a scale of zero to 100, get your response. If it was 92, then you would divide it by 10 and get like 9.2. And then you would add all 10 of those questions up to get your score. I don't know about other, other right. scales, though, besides the KJOC. Yeah, I think that's definitely scale dependent, personally, knowing with all the different ones we use yeah, you probably just in our hit outcomes. Um, yeah. They can be very elaborate and detailed. And I think verbal gets complicated. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank uh, our authors for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. These two great studies. It was great talking to everybody. Phil, thanks. Ashley, thanks for your help. And in like our uh, minute or two we have left, I, I have one more question for Ellen Becker. I don't know if you guys know, but Ellen Becker is a, um, he is a pizza a connoisseur. So I have a, a question and then I have one thing that I, I want to say before we close. Uh, he's a pizza connoisseur. So Todd, if you were to get like your, your best the, your most favorite pizza, you know, it's like your birthday and Gail's going to bring home um, the pizza for you. What is, what is she going to bring home? Well, if she's in Arizona, it's going to be lamp, which is about a mile from our house. Phil and I have actually eaten there yeah. a number of times. There. Uh, it's uh, it's very good. It's a, uh, it's of the, uh, it's from Naples. It's a Naples style Neapolitan uh, Neapolitan type style. It comes from that school, the people that work at that restaurant. So uh, that's sort of like being an, an SCS or a PhD PT or a DPT. That's the that's the yeah. DPT of pizza, if you want to do it. So, uh, but uh, last night I here in New York, I walked a couple blocks down as I got home from the site, and I went to Ray's Pizza, which is a famous Ray's, original original Ray's, if you've seen that on Seinfeld. But nonetheless, it was uh, 52nd and 7th. It's a classic uh, Ray's pizza. So in, in New York, uh, you got to go with the New York style for sure. So uh, yeah, that's a thicker, that's a thicker, right? A thicker. No, it's, uh, it's actually oh, pretty. It's, it's thinner. thinner. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty Chicago. Thin, yeah. Chicago's the thicker. You're thinking yeah, of Chicago uh, thicker. Yeah, Lou Malnati's, yeah. Rob. Remember when yeah. we had George yes. and you and I and everybody went to Lou Malnati's? That's the. Yes. Now, there is no bad pizza, as we all that's know. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> there well isn't know. bad pizza, but uh, yeah, the the New York style or certainly the Neapolitan style is is definitely the best. So. Pizza yeah, margarita. Pizza uh, margarita. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I'd love margarita. What, yeah. What's the fill? Do you know the fill? The fill, yeah. That's 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 Phil's famous uh, pepperoni, that, sausage, and mushroom. That's right. You got to go with all three. Easy. Yeah. Pretty so, easy. Todd, I'm Todd. I'm originally from Scranton, Pennsylvania, which has a little town next to it called Old Forge, and they're the self-proclaimed pizza capital of the world because they have so many pizza places within a, a square mile. But it's yeah. a different style. It's like Todd, you need to go. You need yeah. to go no, there, man. That sounds like a great spot. I, I did a course one time in North Jersey and uh, it wasn't pizza, but it was baked ziti. And uh, the, 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 the clinic brought in their own food for the course. I ate baked ziti for three nights in a row. Home. That's all I ate. I ate off the same exact baked ziti. It was so good. So uh, yeah, well, so, yeah, I know yeah. we're all hungry now. So that's right. Yeah, it's gonna well, be dinner be, time. I'll, well, before uh, we go, hang on, Ashley. I got one okay. more thing I gotta, I gotta tell everybody here. Oh my gosh, um, okay. I think most of everybody doesn't know this, but I wanna congratulate Todd in front of uh, uh, the six of us and the 77 remaining people oh. that are still online. 
Uh, most of you probably don't know, but Todd uh, was, has just received the Fellow of the APTA congratulations. Award. Oh, so uh, congratulations, congratulations, buddy. Well Thank deserved. You very much. Well deserved. I'm so happy for yep. you. Rob was a big part of that. Uh, there's a saying about making a silk palette purse out of a sow's ear. Rob was able to nominate me with some other really, uh, some of my mentors as well. Uh, and that's the only reason I got in. But uh, no, uh, Rob, well, thank you very much. Buddy. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think you really a special it, uh, achievement. And thanks so much. Appreciate you. you your congratulations. Thank you're you. You're welcome, buddy. All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining. Uh, Ashley, do you want to close? Yeah, just I for I, I am apologetic. I usually start by thanking our sponsors. So I want to end by thanking our sponsors for the journal. Please check them out on our website. Um, they This sort of stuff is not possible without them. Um, and I did double check because Hyperice is our sponsor. They also have a pressure sensor uh, within their oh, nice. devices. Okay. Nice. <laughs> um, so it's based on the little lights on the back of the device. It'll tell you your, it'll gauge your pressure. It'll light up on the back of the device. So I just thought I'd throw that out there for their sake. But yes, be sure to check them out. Um, we are doing these again monthly. The emails will be coming out again. Um, certificates will come out here shortly. And then the recording, um, once we get it posted, Mary will send out a blast email of the recording to everyone as well. So and it'll be on our YouTube. So thank you everyone for participating. Great. Thanks, Have a great everybody. Night. Thank, thank you, everybody. Have a good yeah. night. Yeah, thanks, Ash. Yeah. Thanks, guys.